Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Newman. I'm Professor of Space Law and Policy at the University of Northumbria in Newcastle in the United Kingdom. I'm also International Space Law Advisor for the Cold Star Technologies. I listen to the Cold Star Project. This show is for entertainment purposes only and is not what is termed professional advice. The Cold Star Project is proudly presented by the Operational Excellence Society. Cold Star Tech is a supporter of the OPEX Society, and Jason Canigan is a member of its board of advisors. Talk with us at Cold Star Tech to find out what we can achieve together with your Lean Six Sigma or Operational Excellence programs. And check out opexsociety.org to learn more. Today's guest is Matthew Travis. Matt has been a guest before on the Cold Star Project very, very early on, one of the first few uh, space-specific episodes. And uh, I also had him speak at the uh, Make Space Boring virtual conferences, which are a great update on the space industry. And you can go watch those for free. Just go to coldstartech.com, the courses page, and you just go sign up for them for free. And uh, it'll get you a great update on what's going on in space. What I appreciate about Matt especially is that he actually understands what business is, uh, what requirements are, what a startup is like, and what's needed. Uh, He values a lot of the same things about uh, getting a customer, culture, product market fit, and all the uh, kind of goodies that you really need that often uh, startup founders in the space industry tend to avoid or not want to look at because uh, they're so focused on being an inventor of cool stuff. Uh, And unfortunately, inventing cool stuff alone does not lead to a paycheck. All right, so uh, Matt is the founder of Aphelion Aerospace, and that's what we're going to talk about today. It's, uh, you know, a look at the day-to-day operations of this business and uh, all of its Good points, all of the struggles. Matt, welcome. It's great to be back. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about something that you're working on that is new to me. Uh, It's not new to you. (laughs) And folks, I I like having Matt on because he is a sensible business owner. (laughs) Many of you will know that I tear what's left of my hair out about uh, the engineering and inventor startup types who uh, want to invent something, but then don't know how to get paid to do it. And uh, Matt here is quite clear on uh, his understanding of the need to get customers. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So let's, let's talk about what you're working on now, an environmentally friendly propulsion technology for space launch. Whew. <laughs> when I first read that, I was like, okay, well, A, that's a mouthful. B, who decided we needed that? What, what are the indicators that you've seen that uh, show you we need an environmentally friendly propulsion tech for space launch? Sure, that's, that's a really great question. Um, Ironically, we did not initially at our founding set out to utilize environmentally friendly propulsion, but in the end, it made the most business sense for low cost and high reliability. And by the way, it helps take care of the, uh, the environment, which is just as important long-term. So that enabled us to get in on this early on. Uh, we see the, the space industry uh, moving to, in this direction globally, actually, but we did, uh, fortunately, we saw an opportunity uh, before a, a lot of the, the companies and, and government agencies out there. So in terms of the, the need, obviously, if we are going to see more and more and more space launch activity uh, in the coming years with the, with the tremendous growth of the market, especially the small sat launch market, we have to get away from fossil fuels. We cannot, create, we cannot add to an existing problem while we claim that what we're doing is for the benefit of mankind. You know, how is dumping a bunch of CO2 into the atmosphere to the benefit of, man, benefit of mankind? It, it just isn't. Uh, and globally in, in the European Union, Asia, South America, there is this growing awareness, uh, not just to climate change problems in general, but, but with space activities. Um, in addition to that, when it comes to like satellites, most of them use for their onboard propulsion systems on orbit, uh, hydrazine or other toxic chemicals. Hydrazine, I, I don't know how many people are aware of just how uh, toxic it is, but uh, if you ingest it, uh, you better have your will right at hand and ready because that's going to be it for you. And the same with nitrogen tetroxide. Uh, it, you 
know, they're toxic, carcinogenic, uh, costly, extremely, extremely costly. Uh, we're talking, you know, hundreds of dollars per kilogram. It's just ridiculous. So the European Union is pushing toward banning those chemicals on their spacecraft. Uh, there's similar effort uh, going on uh, currently in the United States. Uh, it, they've already been banned for the launch vehicles themselves. Uh, the old Titan rocket used hydrazine. It was phased out in particular. This is one of the reasons why. So we see there's this movement uh, growing from the regulatory side as well as from the market itself. Um, especially the new companies and the startups, they are really globally socially conscious and they want to have clean solutions. Um, and we can provide that. There are a few other companies uh, around the world who are working on similar, uh, I, I won't say similar, but they're also working on clean tech launch solutions and spacecraft solutions. Not many yet, but as you know, month by month, year by year, more and more uh, companies are pivoting in this direction. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the facility you're in there, Matt. Uh, you've got the Aphelion, especially for those who can't see. Uh, it's pretty big. You've got your Aphelion sign. I see a motorcycle <laughs> and a broom, um, but it looks pretty big. And I don't know if there's any machining going on there. Um, tell us a little bit about it. Sure, you might hear a little bit of machine work in the background. Um, so this is our new facility in Lakewood, Colorado, just outside of Denver. And we have leased out, uh, it's multiple rooms totaling uh, around 7,000 square feet. This is the, the conference room, break room, meeting room that I'm in right now. Uh, we are still a little light on furniture, so I apologize for the echo. Um, next door to me that way is our administrative office. Uh, and then downstairs, we have an engineering workshop uh, where our engineers right now are preparing our uh, uh, propulsion test campaign that is going to be taking place uh, within the week. And then we have a large two-story uh, bay where we do fabrication assembly, uh, and test work. So it's multiple uh, multiple rooms in this building. Mm -hmm. And uh, next door to us in a, another 10,000 or so square foot space is our primary uh, partner for metalwork and fabrication services. Okay, cool. That gives us a good picture of uh, what's going on there. So tell us a little bit about what Aphelion's technology looks like them. We say an environmentally friendly space launch technology. <laughs> that could be, what is that, fuel? Is it a burn system? What is it? Um, it starts with the fuel, but it goes to the entire uh, uh, supply chain and production. Okay. Uh, so starting with the fuel, we do have, uh, it's traditional chemical propulsion. We don't, we're not doing you know, fancy lasers or things like that. This is good old rocket engines, still the best way to get to space, but the chemicals themselves are non-polluting and the exhaust products uh, emit less CO2 than liquid oxygen and methane, which is like the gold standard in industry. Uh, nobody's using, well, there's liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, but very few are using that because it's just too much of a burden. Um, but we are cleaner than liquid oxygen and methane. Uh, no fossil fuels, so we do not uh, support the fossil fuel industry. Um, although, you know, it's a critical industry still. We see that with what's going on in Europe right now. But uh, we do not, uh, our processes do not um, support the production or use of fossil fuels. Uh, so two thirds, uh, two thirds to three quarters of our exhaust is water based. Uh, plain and simple. Uh, so it is, it is extremely clean. But we also look at our entire supply chain. One of our goals is by 2030 to be at, at worst carbon neutral. If we can be uh, even below that, even cleaner than that, um, that is our ultimate goal. So one area we're, we're going down is uh, Amazon uh, started the Climate Pact project where companies sign up 
and they commit to achieving carbon neutrality with full auditing of their supply chain production and operations from the extraction of raw materials from the earth through production, sales, and eventual disposal. Uh, so we are getting ready to sign that and commit to that. And one of the tools we use to help us, because it's very complicated, is a tool called GREET, G-R-E-E-T. And I apologize, I suddenly forgot what the acronym stands for, but it was developed by Argonne National Labs, uh, at first oriented toward the automotive industry, but it can be applied to any industry. And it gives a full auditing and tracking of a company's uh, carbon footprint. Excellent, excellent. So, you know, you're developing this, this propulsion system then it sounds like. So it's not just fuel, it involves the, the mechanics of it to be able to make the push happen. Uh, I, I, you know, I think of like, okay, who's the customer for this launch companies are, are obvious, right? Uh, but so, so there you've got a challenge of how do you integrate with their design, right? How do you get them the, the launch vehicle designers to adopt your design? And then I can imagine also that you're able to build a, an influence group, right? Out of uh, other companies, even those getting ride share on those launch vehicles and that to encourage the, uh, the launch vehicle designers to use your system. Um, am I off base? Am I on target? How is it actually working? Uh, you're fairly on target. With the uh, propulsion, our initial focus, uh, well, there's our own launch vehicle, of course. Um, but as far as you know, other companies, other government entities and such, uh, for them, we're focusing real heavily on the in-space propulsion uh, uh, capabilities. Okay. As I mentioned, the European Union eliminating, you know, hydrazine uh, from spacecraft, which 90 plus percent of them, I guess, use it. Uh, we see that as a real, uh, a real strong market opportunity uh, over the over the coming few years. We already have some partnerships in place uh, to support that work, um, and we're constantly working on getting others. And then what we're hoping is, so there's a lot of cynicism about what we're doing. You know, conventional wisdom is if you're doing something that's environmentally friendly, well, it must be more expensive than fossil fuels because otherwise why would we not be doing it already? Uh, and lower performing, you know, the analogy of electric cars when they first came out, you know, you'd have to recharge your battery after hundred miles, whereas it get, a tank of gas would take you four or 500. So less efficient, less performing, mm -hmm. and, and way more expensive. So, you know, we have to fight against that conventional wisdom. So what we're hoping is the activities we're undertaking, including, you know, just, I guess, I think now four, five days from now with our propulsion testing, we're proving that not only does it work in terms of the engineering, but it is, less expensive it is more reliable its performance is just as good as anything else out there except for some of the exotics and it is environmentally friendly mm -hmm. as we can prove this out we hope that we will really spur the industry as a whole to look harder at these type of technologies because it's not just ours there are other clean technologies that that can be uh employed. So really it's a, a lot of convincing the industry that this is the way to go. And as we do that, then that opens up opportunities for partnerships, sales, uh, purchases from partners who embrace clean tech, uh, and it'll really help grow the industry. Good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, fashion of the moment is is like a key ignition thing sometimes and it's frustrating because in, in many cases the thing was important or worked beforehand uh, before it became fashionable and then suddenly okay user adoption is key right and then that no now it's okay it's all over the place but you know then th those uh poor folks who kind of stuck it out <laughs> from the beginning have had to go through a lot we've seen this in many fields oh, yes. uh, in space especially over the years uh, so who are the the 
the main customers? You know, you're focusing on NATO satellites, I guess, as your target market. Who, who is who's your buyer? Sure. Uh, initially, the, we're, you know, we're following what most other most other companies have done in terms of uh, commercialization and looking at both uh, government contracts, the you know high risk tolerant contracts where you know, like the Space Development Agency is willing to put a test payload on our rocket, uh, you know, because they can afford to lose it, but it, it also supports us and, and the industry. They did that with Astra, they've done it with others. Um, and then the other early focus um, is academia and other startup companies. So we have some LOIs with nanosatellite startups, um, uh, internationally, uh, especially in South America, uh, we have a strong presence growing there. Uh, and then academia, we have uh, relationships that are growing with academic institutions. Um, they're, it's not that they're high risk tolerant, it's they're just really cash strapped. So we actually offer special terms to uh, academic institutions and nonprofits to support them. Uh, one concrete project I can talk about is there is a STEM oriented uh, program involving schools now uh, internationally. Uh, I believe we have like two dozen or so schools signed up. Uh, it's a it's a project that Aphelion is a part of. Uh, we have representation from uh, the AMSAT organization, uh, Aldrin Family Foundation. Uh, is supportive of us as well. It's being led by a gentleman named Greg Kennedy, C-A-N-N-C-A-N-N-C-A-N-N-A-D-Y. -N 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 um, please, anybody, feel free to look him up. And if you want to get involved in this, it, it'd be great. It's a totally nonprofit project. And what it's doing is taking to schools ground-based CubeSat simulators to give, especially um, high school students, experience in learning what a CubeSat is and how to operate them, how to build them. And then the second phase of this is taking those, taking a simulated CubeSat onto a balloon, a high altitude balloon, and doing experiments and, and studies with that. And then the third phase for the exceptional schools, the exceptional teams in the schools, uh, they will be on track to have actual CubeSats that get launched into orbit. So this is a multi-year uh, indefinite duration program that uh, we're surprised at how, how fast it's been, um, how fast it's been growing. We just started this, I guess, a couple months ago and schools are jumping on board left and right. It is just tremendous. Yeah, well, people like <laughs> playing with stuff and this is cool <laughs> stuff. <laughs> So that's great. Very true. Yeah. And uh, getting getting some hands-on experience, I think, you know, there's no there's no downside to it. So um, that kind of partnership is uh, pretty easy to uh, to move forward on. So Absolutely. tell us, Matt, how this technology will impact both the marketplace and the, the planet's ecosystem. Well, uh, for the for the planet's ecosystem, the, the biggest impact is you know, the, the launch industry and the satellite industry, uh, once there's wider adoption, we'll be able to mitigate and minimize, hopefully, uh, the adverse effects to the climate that space launch, uh, sad to say, has had uh, since the beginning. Um, and, you know, really, Protecting the environment is is essential. I mean, we we talk about colonizing Mars. Why do we have to, you know, ruin Earth in order to, in order to do that? And then once we're on Mars, we don't want to ruin that climate either. Um, so you know, there is that impact, and it's one that it's not immediate. It's you know, it's real hard to change the direction of an entire industry. Mm -hmm. But once there's a critical point reached, I, I think you'll see that. Uh, with that inflection, that there will be significant uh, change in that regard. And, you know, also from the business standpoint, low cost, 
high reliability, ease of handling. That's another thing. We don't require skate suits and, and oxygen tanks in order to work around our technology. Yeah. It's basically, you know, quote, not rubber, because that wouldn't work with our chemical, but, you know, rubber gloves and a face mask and coveralls, and that's all you need, um, uh, a mask. Mm -hmm. uh, very, I won't say safe, because that'll get me in trouble with lawyers down the road, mm -hmm. I'm sure, but it is safer than anything else out there. Okay. As, as the PPE you have to wear, it's minimal compared exactly, to other stuff. Exactly. Okay. And it's non-cryogenic. We don't have to carry locks, farms around or anything like that. So safer, lower cost, cleaner. And what that does for the industry, uh, for companies in the industry who adopt this type of technology, it actually makes for a better business case. The CapEx required to build out a factory, to build out you know, a launch pad yeah. is lowered significantly when you eliminate cryogenics, toxic propellants, and, and things like that. So new companies down the road, if they want to pursue the, you know, the lowest cost path to market, this is one of the strategies that they could employ uh, to help them do so. And, and that's why, you know, like I said, once, once we really, really prove that this is a viable path, I think, uh, that you will see many more companies uh, adopting this type of technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the issue is always moving from zero to one. <laughs> and once, <laughs> once somebody does that, suddenly there's a, oh, it's, it's proven fact now, right? And uh, oh, yeah, I mean, look at always do it, you know? Yeah, look at look at SpaceX before uh, 2015, before Falcon 9 actually landed, it was conventional wisdom that you cannot do a powered descent and landing of a rocket in, in that fashion, uh, you know, of, of a space launch rocket. Everybody knew it was impossible. Everybody except SpaceX, and they just did it. Right. Um, and now everybody's going that direction, even us. Um, so, it, although I will say, McDonnell Douglas first pioneered that back in the 80s. Hmm. And if you look at the Falcon 9 flight profile, and even the terminology that's used, it's almost identical to McDonnell Douglas research. But what did SpaceX have that McDonnell Douglas didn't have? The desire to innovate, the resources to back it up, and the workforce excited mm -hmm. to be basically doing something nobody's ever done. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that goes back to what you were pointing out earlier about being kind of the, the, the weirdo of the industry in a way, right? <laughs> having the cynicism around it, right? That's not always a bad position to be in, right? Uh, having, having a narrative and having a marketing story basically to push off of uh, can be a really good thing. So, um, you know, it makes it makes it easier to understand. So I want to hear about the journey that you've had developing this technology. Um, you know, you and I have talked a fair amount over the years. Sometimes there's long pauses in between. <laughs> I'm going to make fun of you for that. Uh, I don't like that. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but then you come back and it's like, hey, I've been doing this thing, right? I want to hear about the, the hurdles that you've experienced and the successes that you've experienced in, in the R&D uh, flow, because I think the, the engineers and inventors will enjoy it. The young students will enjoy it, uh, you know, and maybe us old gray beards, like you say. <laughs> We'll get something out of it as well. Sure. Um, really, it's, we've had challenges since the beginning, um, about four years ago, I guess now, or some time flies when you're in a yeah. startup, I guess. Um, you know, I mentioned originally we didn't start out planning to be, to you, you know, use environmentally friendly propulsion. Mm -hmm. um, our initial plan uh, once we uh, down-selected different types of propellants and whatnot, way, way early on, we originally had settled on hydrogen peroxide and kerosene. Hmm. Nothing wrong with that, even though it's not environmentally friendly. Um, but it did get rid of our uh, cryogenics. That was a big goal. And with a catalyst bed for the peroxide, it eliminated the need for an ignition system, mm -hmm. which is a source of reliability issue. We saw that recently with both Astra and Firefly. Mm -hmm. uh, so we eliminated that 
uh, that risk. What we didn't foresee was the impracticality of manufacturing our own catalyst beds. We could not get the reliability we needed. We had uh, inadequate uh, silver plating on the screens. We just, it, 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 we tried and tried and tried and we just couldn't get the quality we needed for space launch. To buy catalyst beds on the market is prohibitively expensive. For our rocket, the cost of catalyst beds would have been about 50% of the total COGS, you know, cost of goods uh, for the rocket itself. So almost in desperation, we looked for alternatives and we did find an alternative uh, that does not use a catalyst bed. Um, as soon as our patents are filed, I'll be able to say exactly what that <laughs> alternative is. Yeah. Um, but it, it ended up being really an ideal solution. And, and you know, once we did our, our initial test with it, I mean, we, we all just fell in love with it. Mm. Um, but that was a tough time. We actually had one of our um, lead engineers um, offer, to, offer to resign from the company because this catalyst bed problem was insolvable. I wouldn't let them do that. Um, uh, we just found a solution. But what really, if I had to look at the past several years and cumulatively what has cost us the most in wasted dollars and time, because every company wastes some dollars and some time, it's the unexpected. And not even necessarily the unexpected engineering matters mm -hmm. because if you're doing an engineering project, you really shouldn't have any unexpected. Um, you can have things that you don't foresee, but that's your own fault. But really there, there are things that happen that you cannot predict or forecast or even plan for. I mean, the big one, COVID. Mm -hmm. There's no way anybody could have planned for a global pandemic. And, you know, having your business shut down by the, by the governor because you're not essential. That's, that's nothing you could ever have thought about ahead of time. Um, on, on a smaller scale, um, potentially bigger for us, back uh, a few years ago in March or so, we were still in New Jersey and nice spring day and then a storm came through and got hit by a tornado. Blew out all the buildings on the, uh, blew out all the windows on the buildings, ripped off the roofs, blew away scaffolding, um, that, that cost us time and money and headache. Fortunately, nobody was injured and none of our hardware was damaged, but you know, it's just all these things accumulate over time. And you look back and you're like, okay, we've been doing this for three years, but we can see we easily had six months where we were not productive because we were just dealing with problems. Mm -hmm. Right now we're dealing with a problem which hopefully will be solved tomorrow um, when our test and propellant tanks, we had some new ones uh, fabricated. The welding work did not meet uh, our requirements. So we had to find another vendor, have those tanks taken apart and re-weld it, which is what is happening right now. But that cost us two weeks. Um, you say, okay, two weeks, that's not too bad. But if you have two weeks here, three days there, a week here, a week there, for a startup, it's, it's just, it, it's a killer. Um, it, it, those kind of things accumulate and you find your, your company reaching the end of its funding runway and you're scrambling for, for bridge funding or to close your next funding round, which we're doing. Um, to say it's stressful would be an understatement. <laughs> Um, yeah. But what I, my advice would be plan, identify and plan for literally everything you can on the engineering side, mm -hmm. but be aware that it's the things that are completely unrelated to your work that are going to get in your way as much as anything. Mm -hmm. And you have to be agile, you have to react quickly, and you have to just keep moving forward. That's tough. Uh, the good news is your competitors are experiencing the same kind of things. Uh, exactly. So we're all slowed down. Um, but 
your point, you know, you could create the greatest Gantt chart with a critical path, uh, the, you know, in the world, but uh, that tornado is going to come by. Right? Yeah, uh, you, know, I, you know, I guess I could go into our business plan and, and the timeline and put in, you know, where we had 2020 doing this, this, yeah. and this. I could just like scratch all that out and just put COVID. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to build that kind of slack in there. You know, it's, no. not, it's not possible. Uh, and, and for those wondering, you know, about delays in that, it may not just be uh, the two weeks either or the welding or whatever, right? Uh, if you're building a home, a new home, and the, and the municipal inspector needs to come by to check the workout, uh, if you miss that date, they might not come back for another month. Yeah. Right? And, and then, sorry, you got to wait because I know um, Matt Spoiler's here. <laughs> the welding's going to have to be inspected again and somebody's going to have to do it, right? And yep. uh, the queue time for these things is usually longer than the actual production time, right? Uh, waiting around. So. Oh, exactly. And, and you know how it is with contractors. Whenever you ask them for an update, they tell you it'll be ready in two weeks. You come back three days later, they tell you two weeks. It's always two weeks. Right. You know, three days, six days ago. <laughs> Um, let's talk about, there's a couple more issues here I think we could dig into, supply chain and retaining talent. Let's talk a little bit about that with your experience over the last bunch of years. Supply chain has been a fun challenge, uh, to say the least. Um, you know, when we first started, we had the trade war going on with China, and a lot of our raw materials uh, we sourced from China, not sensitive stuff, but like uh, the structure that holds up our tanks is made from extruded aluminum that was imported from China, you know, things like that. And it wasn't so much that we couldn't find the materials, it's that the price was always changing. Mm. Uh, we had priced out, uh, I forget uh, what system was for, but we needed to buy some, uh, some steel rods. And so we got a quote, uh, from the company um, and then several days later maybe it was a week later we went to, to make the purchase and the price had suddenly more than doubled mm -hmm. and it was all because of the trade war and the tariffs that that really that really messes with your budgeting right. and your planning um, then you know deferring other purchases to cover that and it, you know it, sometimes it, it feels almost like you're going to end up in a death spiral of procurement mm -hmm. Um, and now, um, now, you know, we are being very careful about what we source from overseas. Mm -hmm. we, we actually have pressure, uh, with some of our partners and stakeholders to do as much procurement within the United States as possible, uh, which is, which is, um, fine for us. We, we like, we like buying America. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it supports our industry and, and small businesses even. Uh, but really with COVID, sorry to go back to COVID, but it totally screwed up all the supply chains. I mean, globally. We have lead times on things that used to be able to just go down to the, a local e electronics store and, and buy a bag of them. Now we have to order them online and it's like two, three month lead time. Um, so, some of the audience might know what a Raspberry Pi computer is, a little little credit card size computer. Uh, normally they sell for about $35, the, the full size. Right now you can't, you, you can hardly find them anywhere. The main uh, distributors are sold out completely uh, with projected restock dates sometime in July, because I checked just a couple weeks ago. Um, and looking on Amazon, you can find a few, but now it's like $150. So it's, they talk, people talk about supply chain management. Right now, uh, things are so, really so challenging. I think management might be a bit generous of a, mm -hmm. of a word <laughs> for what's going on. And who knows what the war in, in Europe is going to do. Uh, Fortunately, we do not have a critical path in our supply chain that goes through Europe. So, and and we don't we don't use oil. So, uh, we think we're pretty well insulated. But still, that is um, is going to present tremendous issues. Uh, 
industry-wide, not just our industry, but I think every industry. Uh, weird thing is everybody thought that the supply chain issues would have cleared up by now. Because mm -hmm. there's, when you think about it, there's literally no reason why the supply chain is still broken around the world. Um, unfortunately, it, it is. Uh, you know, and, it, and in the end, since it's an unusual situation we're in right now, you know, in large part, you just have to deal with it, juggle your procurement. When you, when you create your project plans, you have to consider long lead times for critical components. Uh, you know, it, it makes having a crash program a bit more difficult, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, which is what we've been dealing with. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to put into words because it's honestly, it's really, really confusing just how, how messed up the, the situation is right now. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's bad enough when you want to move fast and iterate and then you don't have the materials to work with, right? It's like, there's just nothing, nothing there. And now we're waiting around. You mentioned early on uh, about um, a senior employee, a, a designer who wanted to leave because the problem seemed insoluble. Uh, tell us maybe a little bit more about, about retaining talent as a startup as you've gone on. And, you know, you have these funding dips and valleys and then the frustration of, well, I want to work on this project, but uh, the key doohickey isn't here and isn't going to be here for three months and I'm mad, right? And then they come to you and, <laughs> you know, it's there's a lot of irrationality in there, you know, then emotion and... Uh, Oh, absolutely. Not easy to deal with. Absolutely. And I think uh, unless you're a startup that is backed by, you know, the proverbial billionaire angel, I think just about every startup uh, faces that type of issue. I, I think, especially in the space industry, it's easy to attract really good talent, not just in terms of resumes, but uh, the quality of person. I think it's it's fairly easy because everybody wants to get into space. Um, I'm getting resumes, you know, two, three of them a day, every day. So it's not attracting talent, but retaining talent in a startup is a challenge. Um, we have had some turnover uh, over, over the past few years uh, with high quality talent, but the startup environment, the stresses, the anxiety, the ups and downs, really just was not uh, something that, uh, an environment they wanted to be in. And that's fine. I, sometimes I, I think to myself, I would never recommend somebody join a startup because it is just, yeah. it, it's, it's beyond stressful at times. Um, but the, the positive side of that is the talent that is retained is exactly the talent you want to retain because they have the skills, but they also have the ability to uh, deal with the ups and downs while still making progress. And they have the loyalty to the company and the vision um, and, and they stick around. Even to the point, a lot of startups, uh, key employees don't get paid, they get they get equity and they work on sweat equity until the funding stream opens up enough uh, that they can you know, earn a paycheck. That's not unusual. Uh, it's not ideal that everybody wants to get paid, um, but you know, even, how do I put it? Um, it's easy to come in knowing that you'll be working on sweat equity in a startup. Because then you, be, you, you become one of the founding team and then you benefit just that much more down the road. But for, for uh, personnel who uh, are hired by a company, by a startup, and they haven't gone through the downs yet, that first dip they get, the first uh, valley of death at the end of a runway, that's a big test for them. Yeah. Um, and it requires a lot of support from the leadership uh, like I feel in from Miguel and, and, and from me um, to encourage them to, you know, not lose faith, to keep them 
uh, update on what's going on, to be transparent uh, about you know what we're doing on the business side and the progress and and the outlook for the next funding round and and all of that. You know, it's real important. To basically, keep their spirits up in the down times and and let them know that you know they're not in the boat alone. We're in it too. Any of the ups that benefit any of us will benefit all of us. Any of the downs that we just have to struggle through, we're all struggling together. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there is a, in the end, there is a, a finite uh, limit uh, to how much of the, of the down anyone could take. You know, if you go a year and you still aren't getting paid, by the way, that's not the case for us. But <laughs> if you're going a year and still not getting paid, I can't imagine anybody, anybody but the original founder would want to stay on. You know, people do uh, have their limits. And that's why when there are the down times, you know, I, I, I've always told every, everyone, who, you know, everybody on my team, you know, if for your own well-being and for your own good, you feel you need to look for other opportunities. I'm not going to stand in your way. I'll help you find and get another opportunity if that's what you really want. You know, you're not a slave to this company. So, you know, anything that we can do to support, uh, you know, really to support you, we want to do that. Right. Yeah. And folks, Matt here is a realist. <laughs> I've known that since the first time I talked to him. You're always going to get the truth. Uh, I can say, I'm not going to name names, but I can say there are a lot of founders that I've talked to who have been uh, well over a year without making money. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> tell me about the pressures. And, and I know what that's like in a, in a startup situation as well. Uh, it's not always easy. There's a resilience factor that anybody going to work for a startup really needs to have. And, and like you say, when, when you're a co-founder, and you come in and you know what you're getting into, fine. That's one thing, right? But uh, as, a, as an engineer, line employee, something like that, right? When you're expecting a steady paycheck uh, and maybe you don't have a lot of experience yet, kind of wet behind the ears. Uh, it's easy to get, come in on the excitement and then, um, you know, kind of get punched in the gut. Uh, the first time they say, well, hold on to those paychecks. <laughs> we, can't, we can't let you cash them this week, right? Uh, it's, that's not always fun, but it is a part of uh, real startup culture. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the operational areas of sales and production. We almost never hear about this uh, in the space industry. Everybody's so focused on inventing. I want to hear about this since, especially since, Matt, this is not your first iteration of your first space company right? You have learned and gotten to this point where you're like, okay, it's great. I need a great product. I know that, but I also need to go out there and get customers. So what has, what has that experience been like with sales and production? Well, let me start with production because we are presently building out our, our production capacity. Um, startups face the challenge of getting to market as quickly as they can and the pressure to be as vertically integrated as possible. Mm -hmm. Investors like it when you do everything yourselves in-house because it build up IP, build up value of the company, mm -hmm. um, all those good things. There, there are exceptions um, like Phantom Space. Their strategy is actually to outsource as much as they can, which is really a, a really intriguing uh, business model. Uh, but for the most part, there's the pressure to vertically integrate. When you vertically integrate, you have to build your own factories, do massive hiring. The CapEx requirements are, especially for space launch, are ridiculously high. And then you cannot get to market as fast as you originally wanted. So our strategy is to have, I'll call it a, I'm sure there's a term that I'm not remembering right now, but it's more of like a diagonal integration mm -hmm. where our core competencies uh, are all in-house. So the propulsion and such, we do have propulsion partners, but like the design and R&D really is, is uh, our core competency. Okay. Uh, for initial manufacturing and, you know, and things like that, we have partners who are uh, committed uh, to 
supporting that work with us so we don't have to build a factory full of CNC machines. There's literally one right behind this wall. Um, and so we have this combination of in-house and our partners to where we can get to market uh, on a good timeline, yet these aren't just vendors. These are actual business partners. So it's almost like a consortium that is vertically integrated, even though it is you know, separate companies, it is still part of the same um, production plan and, and operation. So it's kind of a, kind of a hybrid. Uh, as we move forward uh, down the road, you know, someday, hopefully soon, we will need a larger facility. We will need our own factory. Uh, we will need to start pulling in that expertise internally. Uh, so vertically integrate as we grow. And we do have a, a plan for doing that. It's uh, since that's, you know, down the road a few years, uh, the plan is still a little bit loose and flexible, but we do have a plan uh, with our partners on how to bring those capabilities all under one umbrella. Uh, so that's, I think we're good, uh, a good strategy there. I hope, uh, unless a billionaire again, you know, knocks on the door and says, here's a hundred million dollars, go build a factory, then we might, we might change our plans, but uh, we're not anticipating that uh, happening. Um, sales is interesting. Uh, selling CubeSats is fairly easy. CubeSats have become basically a commodity, the cell phone of space. Um, so uh, we do direct sales, you know, calling up and visiting universities, uh, Zoom meetings with uh, space agencies around the world. And we can usually get uh, an LOI after just a meeting or two. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not been difficult. Launch is difficult for us because we still haven't launched a rocket. Uh, by the way, we are targeting end of this year for a suborbital demonstration launch uh, for everybody. Keep your uh, eyes open for news on that as we move forward. Um, but a lot of the, the early launches that we're going to do are, we assume are gonna be under some government launch contract. Even if we have a, an academic payload on the rocket, it'll probably be you know, one of NASA's high risk tolerant launch contracts that they put out every year, uh, or maybe uh, the CubeSat launch initiative or something or flight opportunities. So there it's not so much a sales operation as it is, you know, government contract bidding, mm. um, which is its own uh, weird universe entirely. Um, we do have on our team uh, some folks who have deep experience in that world and they are providing strategic advice and capabilities to us. We have both. Um, paid uh, consultants, not full-time staff yet, but paid consultants, as well as uh, a board of advisors. That includes uh, Kevin Rice, who for uh, 20 years uh, was the director of business management at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Following that, he was director of business management for about 20 years or 17 years at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And he actually rebuilt their business operations from the ground up after all those Mars mission failures uh, early this century. He was brought on board specifically to do that. So now he's providing his expertise to us and we're thrilled about that. And so he's got experience with this government contracting, obviously. Also, Ed Mango, NASA's former program manager for the Commercial Crew Program, is one of our advisors, and he was the champion uh, for getting SpaceX and Boeing their commercial crew uh, contracts with NASA. And then a third advisor is a gentleman by the name of Jeff Brim. He's a former vice president, uh, I believe was vice president of digital technologies at Deutsche Telekom. So he has a uh, high level uh, in, uh, 
big industry experience. And then we have two additional advisors. So unfortunately, we're under non-disclosure because they are uh, retiring from the Air Force and things like that. So still under non-disclosure. But we we recognize where we where, where Miguel and I lack, mm-hmm. and that is in uh, we lack experience with the government contracting as well as sales in general. Um, we do both have engineering backgrounds. I have done engineering in a sales organization and a marketing organization, but mostly I would implement, I would would contribute ideas to the strategizing, but chiefly I would lead the implementation of those strategies. So we know where where we have some weaknesses and, um, you know, so we have reached out and and, uh, joined up with uh, folks who do have that experience and, I imagine we will be connecting with more people as time goes on. Good, good. Well, Matt, let's finish up with this then. Where can people find out more about Affiliate and also who do you want to connect with and how should they reach out to you? Sure thing. Uh, So you can find, obviously, Affiliate Aerospace on the web at affiliateaerospace.com. And that is A-P-H-E-L-I-O-N, aerospace.com. Uh, you can find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, and Facebook, and uh, you can get those links from our website as well, or just do a search and you'll find us. Uh, you may find Aphelion Orbitals, our prior company. Uh, just click on the Aphelion Aerospace instead, and that'd be, that would be great. And I would also mention we do have a start engine regulation crowdfunding equity sales campaign going on right now. Uh, it's going to, uh, I don't know if this episode will air before the campaign ends. We may extend it, uh, but right now it's set to end at the end of March. But uh, even after it's over, you can still look at us over on Start Engine as well. And if you'd like to reach out directly, you can either use the form on the website or you can email me at matthew.travis at aerospace.com. That is M-A-T-T-H-E-W dot T-R-A-V-I-S at affiliateaerospace.com. Don't forget the dot. Don't forget the dot. It's not a pale blue one, but (laughs) it's necessary. (laughs) All right, Matt, thanks for doing this. Oh, this has been great. I I enjoy doing these. I enjoy meeting up with you again, Jason. And uh, I promise not to uh, stay out of touch as long this time. I will keep you updated on what we're doing. Sounds good. Hey, thanks for joining us for today's show. Matt's a great guest, isn't he? Uh, Lots of insightful stuff there. Maybe not always the kind of thing you want to hear, but the kind of thing you really do need to hear if you're a student and wanting to know what the future holds, if you're interested uh, in getting into the business rather than just the technical side of space and defense, uh, or you're actually a founder and uh, you're wondering why things maybe haven't been working out the way you think they should. So listen, if you're a founder, and you have got a to-do list as long as your arm and it's important but not urgent stuff you know and you're finding yourself firefighting all the time and you wish darn it can't somebody just come and take care of this to-do list for me that i could trust come talk to us at coldstartech.com book an appointment to speak with me and i'll tell you whether we can fix you up or not listen I want you to think of us like uh, for building your home, kind of. We're like the electricians or the uh, the plumbers or the framing contractors. We are the people who set up the systems and processes that stand up these space and defense businesses, okay? So anything you got there. If we can't help you, I will tell you and uh, just straight up, and I probably know somebody who can, all right? So go over to coldstartech.com, book a time to speak with us, and tune in next time for another great episode of the Cold Star Project. <laughs>